so glad that you are here. And uh, the Sunday before Thanksgiving is always a special, special day for me and for many of you. And uh, I want to welcome those of you uh, who are in the parking lot, those of you who are in the multi-purpose room. The Lord met with us the first service, and I know He's going to do the same today. We welcome those of you watching on uh, Facebook today, and uh, we want to sing our praise to the Lord today. This is my favorite, favorite Thanksgiving hymn. All right, let's stand together and sing. When the Lord
to welcome you, uh, members that are here for the first time in, in a few weeks or a few months, we will welcome you back. It's always great to be back together as uh, the family of God. Um, if you would, if you're a guest this morning, we just want you to, uh, the number on the screen there, if you're in the parking lot or you're in the multipurpose room or on Facebook, you're watching live this morning, if you could just pull out your cell phone and text your name and guest to 731 400 0646. We just want to have a record of your attendance this morning. We just want to thank you uh, to be in touch with you. We just want to uh, pray for you uh, throughout the week. If you have a prayer request, you can also text that same number and we'll be glad to pray for you this week. Um, I love this time of year, as Brother Alex said. It's so wonderful to get together with friends and family that you don't get to see on a regular basis. Um, I'm thankful for so many things, and just a couple things that I'm thankful for is that 12 years ago that God moved me and my family here so that eventually we could be a part of Riverview Baptist Church. Um, and then just right after that, I'm thankful that the Lord spared my life in a, in a car wreck that could have ended it. And then, a couple years later, I got my salvation on the right side of of the baptism and um, on September 11th, uh, I completely uh, gave my life to Christ and it's amazing what uh, God can do when you allow him to, to do things in your life. So um, if you would just pray with me this morning, Lord, we just come to you as friends, as family, uh, gathered as one this morning. We just thank you for uh, the little things that sometimes we, we take for granted. We just thank you for uh, the, the great showing that we have this morning, the, the visitors that are here, we just want to thank you for them. Uh, the, the people that have been out for uh, weeks or months uh, due to sickness or uh, uh, a pandemic, that you just uh, give them blessings that um, they can't describe any other way except uh, that God, you brought us through. We just ask that you would go with us this week as we in, encounter our, our friends and our family that, that may not know you as their Lord and Savior. Just help us to resist the gospel in a way that they can understand and so that they can completely give their life over to you and that eternally we will live together in heaven. In the name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. <coughs>
glad to say amen. 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 Well, this is a course some of you might know. It might be new, but I'll tell you it's easy. Choir help us sing it. Thanks. Thanks.
with all the Israelites and you've been held in bondage in a land called Egypt. And you know the story. You've already, you perhaps if you've been uh, studying the Bible any at all in your life, you, you know the story. We can't cover all of it. But I want us to begin in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verses 13 and 14. Grumbler are grateful. Exodus 1. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously. And they made their lives bitter with hard labor in all mortar and bricks. And in all kinds of labor in the field. All their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. As you can see, living in Egypt was uh, very demanding. It was very difficult. The Israelites had all they could take. And the Israelites begged God. They said, God, would you deliver us from this land of bondage? Would you help us? If you'll turn to Exodus chapter 2, just one page over. Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25. Here's the next part of the journey. Now it came about in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. You know the story. The king of Egypt died, and uh, there rose a new king in Egypt. His name was Pharaoh. You also know from Exodus 3 that there's a man named Moses. And God appears to Moses in a burning bush, a very unusual thing. And God said, Moses, I'm choosing you. I want you to lead my people out of bondage, out of Egypt. I want you to lead them to the promised land. You know the story. Pharaoh refuses. And so God sends ten plagues upon Egypt. By the tenth plague, by the time that it was over, Pharaoh said, Okay, God, we've had enough. We're going to let your people go. And so the Israelites started on a journey toward the promised land. The Bible describes it a land flowing with milk and honey. Compared to Egypt, it was a little heaven on earth. And there they began this journey, which turned out to be 40 years. Uh, we find in Exodus chapter 14, as we fast forward on this journey, just direct your attention to the screen. Would you, Pharaoh changed his mind and he gathered his army. And I want you to read this. Then they said to Moses, Is it because that there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. You know what happened. They, they, they left and Pharaoh changed his mind. So he gathered his army and uh, they're following the Israelites. They're right on their tail. And the Israelites come to this thing called the Red Sea. You know about it. The Red Sea, they couldn't get around it. They couldn't go over it. They couldn't go through it. And they heard the hoofbeats of Pharaoh's army as they rode the horses and as they, as they encroached upon the Israelites. And the Israelites begged out to God, God, would you help us? Would you help us? And what did God do? God divided the Red Sea and the Israelites. They all crossed on dry ground. And then when Pharaoh and his armies began to cross the, dry, the Red Sea on dry ground, God descended the waters and the army drowned. And you talk about a miracle, that's a miracle. Has there ever been a miracle in your life that the only way that it could have taken place was by God? I mean, there's no other explanation but God. But God. And that's what the Israelites had found. But yet, 
we find right after that passage in Exodus chapter 14 that the Israelites grumbled. They grumbled. Really? <laughs> they asked God for deliverance and God responds and yet they grumble because they wish they were back in Egypt. I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want to look you, for you to look to the right or the left. I don't want you to amen. I don't want you to do anything. But can I just ask you, can you identify as the preacher can with that? God works a miracle that can only be explained by Him. And when you come to the next crisis in life, instead of being grateful, we grumble. That's what the Israelites did. Can you imagine? I mean, can you just imagine? I, I mean, put yourself in this situation. That Red Sea crosses, you're strutting along on dry ground. And then when Pharaoh's army comes, the water's drowning. Can you imagine the victory? Can you imagine the thrill of victory? The celebration? Can you imagine the high fives going on? If they had a, a, a bucket of Gatorade, I'm sure they poured it on Moses, the coach, you know? I mean, they were celebrating the victory. And then all of a sudden, they find themselves grumbling again. Well, as we continue on this journey in Exodus chapter 15, verses 23 through 24, look at what the Bible says. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled. There's that word again. They grumbled at Moses saying, What shall we drink? Now listen, these folks had just seen the Red Sea open up and they crossed on their dry ground. But now they run into a crisis and they start grumbling again. Now I'll be the first to admit, this was not an easy crisis. I mean, when you're out in the wilderness going for three solid days and there's not any water, that's an issue. That's a crisis. But instead of saying, you know what, God, you've worked a miracle before, you're going to work it again, what does the Bible say they do? You see it on the screen. So they crumbled. They crumbled. But once again, if you were to keep reading in this passage, you, you will find out that God turned the bitter water and made it sweet water. So once again, He provided for them. He met their needs. As we continue on this journey with the Israelites, in Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, the Bible says, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. We sat by the pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. <laughs> there we go again. They said, Moses, you just don't realize how good we had it in Egypt. <laughs> Do you remember what we just read in, 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 in Exodus chapters 1 and 2? They hated it. They wanted to go. And now they think Egypt was the greatest place in the world. And they said, Moses, at least we had something to eat. At least we had something to eat. And if you were to continue on in Exodus chapter 16, you'll find that the Lord God provided manna every day. And not only did He provide manna for them to eat, He provided meat for them to eat every day. Has God ever provided for you? I, I mean, just met your needs according to His riches and glory. And then when the next time comes and you don't see how God is going to come through for you financially, physically, emotionally, whatever. And you begin to say, God, I had it better, a whole a lot better back, back in Egypt. And we start that grumbling once again. Again, I'm just saying, I, I, I'm preaching to the preacher. You understand what I'm saying? I'm preaching to the preacher. 
And our last stop on this journey with the grumbling Israelites is found in chapter 17, verses 1 through 3. Then all the congregations of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin according to the command of the Lord and kept in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses. They grumbled with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel? Why do you grumble with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and they grumbled against Moses and said, Why now have you brought us for means of to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Once again, they have God already provided sweet water for bitter water. Now they come, and it's another crisis. They don't have any water. But yet, they didn't learn anything. They didn't learn that God will meet our needs according to His riches in glory. And so, they began to grumble against Moses, and they said, Once again, why did you lead us out of Egypt? And they didn't remember that what God had provided in the past, He's just as able to do it today and do it tomorrow and do it next week. They had already encountered this problem and God provided. And you would think they would understand by now. You would think that they would learn the lesson, hey, if I just learn to live in gratefulness, I don't have to be consumed by grumbling. But yet they had a hard time learning that lesson. Again, don't look to your neighbor. Don't say amen. Don't raise your hand. But I'm just wondering how many of us in the room, we've seen God do it time and time and time and time again. But yet, when we come to another crisis, we find ourselves grumbling instead of being grateful. Again, I'm preaching to the preacher. You get it? You, you understand? The journey for the Israelites really continues throughout the book of Exodus. But I think we've seen enough grumbling for today. I just want to give you just a few principles about grumbling. Grumbling or grateful? Grumbling is an insult to God who gives us all things. When I grumble, it really is an insult to the God of the universe who richly supplies us with all things. Secondly, grumbling negatively affects us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I, I don't know if anybody's been to the doctor And they said, listen, you're just, you're, you're just too grateful. You, you've got such a good attitude, and that's why you're staying sick all the time. You just have such a good attitude, and that's why we're going to put you on 20 medications. Because you have such a good attitude. I, I just know that there are some biblical principles that say that grumbling affects us in a negative fashion physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Number three, grumbling is a tool of the devil. If he can get us to grumble instead of being grateful, then he's accomplished his purpose. You see, as a Christian, as a Christian, you've asked the Lord Jesus into your heart, you're on your way to heaven, prayerfully you're living the victorious Christian life, and he knows that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. But if he can get us to grumble, then it affects everything else. It really is a tool of the devil. Number four, grumbling clouds gratefulness. Grumbling just puts a dark cloud over gratefulness. But in contrast, there will never be any adverse effects on a person who is grateful and thankful. Grateful and thankful 
Well, and isn't that the same? Why are you just repeating yourself? Grateful and thankful. Well, it, it's really two different things. They're kissing cousins. They go hand in hand, really. Gratefulness is an attitude of the heart. <clears throat> you see, that's where it all starts. Gratefulness is an attitude of the heart. It's having a heart that recognizes, God, you've been so good to me. And God, this has been a difficult year. But even in spite of the difficulty, you've still been good to me. Can I just tell you, I, I, perhaps I've heard this before, I, I don't know, I, but I did think about it this week as I was studying. If you want to know if you're blessed or not, some of you might be wondering, is the year that I've been through, I don't really know if I'm blessed or not. Let me just tell you a good way to know if you're blessed. You just begin to write down the things that you have that money cannot buy. And you'll know if you're blessed or not. And can I make a conclusion? Everybody in the room is blessed. If we go by that definition. Do, do we have those things that money cannot buy? Every one of us in the room is blessed. Gratefulness is an attitude of the heart. But thankfulness is an expression from the mouth. And can I tell you, it all starts with the heart. Gratitude is an expression of the heart, or is an attitude of the heart. Thankfulness is an expression from the mouth. And I would dare say you can't express thankfulness unless you have gratefulness first. It all originates from the heart, and then it's just got to come forth from the mouth. Gratefulness, thankfulness. Christian, listen to me. We of all people have reason to be grateful and thankful. Listen, we have the blessings of God. We have the promises of God. We have the Word of God. We have salvation from God. We're going to baptize some folks at the end of the service today who's experienced the salvation of God just recently. We have provision from God. We have the presence of God. We have the forgiveness of God. We have the grace of God. We have the mercy of God. We have the power of God. And thank God we have the peace of God. And peace with God. Can I tell you, those are some things that money cannot buy. Money can't buy it. Church, I'm telling you, the devil wants us to grumble instead of being grateful. I close with this, that gratefulness, an attitude of gratitude, is a choice. It really is a choice. God, I, I've had COVID this year, or I've had a death this year, or I've lost my job this year, or whatever it is. And God, I, I don't want to go through all that again. But God, I'm making a choice right here today, right now, that I'm going to count my blessings as we sing about it. And I'm going to take them one by one. And I'm going to be totally surprised when I see what the Lord has done. Riverview, may we be a church family that's known throughout the community of being a grateful people. Let's not be grumblers, but let's choose to be grateful. I want you to see from just a few church members, see how their gratefulness comes forth from their mouth into thankfulness. I know that we are all thankful for our friends and our family, but I think the most that I'm thankful for is that I have the freedom to come and worship in my church. And I'm also thankful that Jesus gives me the ability and the strength to serve Him and serve my church. I'm thankful for many things, but today I'm thankful that when I woke up this morning, I had heat in my house, I have clothes to wear, I have food in my refrigerator. I have a car with gas in it. And I'm really thankful that I can come to worship without being persecuted. Prayer 
in a world where I have a church home that is filled with so many godly men that I can look up to, like Brother Alan, Brother Jerry, Paul's me, Mr. Dennis, and my dad and my dad. Well, I just want to thank you, first of all, for allowing us to speak to our brothers and sisters in our precious service. And we, this has been trying times, and we miss each one of you, love each one of you, and we just miss the warm handshakes and those that we used to get. But, you know, we, we sometimes feel sorry for ourselves because of this COVID. I get to think about all the blessings, the wonderful, wonderful blessings from God that we have enjoyed, regardless of circumstances. You know, our joy is not limited to our circumstances. Thank God it's not. He is our joy. He has promised to be our joy and our peace. And he has been that to us through all these, I call them lonesome days when we can't see our church family the way we wish to be to them. But you know, we get to associate through the media and phone call and keep in touch with their precious family. So you have the privilege to enjoy and pray, not just for the needs, but whenever we hear of accomplishments and things that God has done for our brothers and sisters, we just rejoice with them over that. And this is a trying time in one, one way. But it's also a blessed time because God is still on the throne. He still loves us. And He looks at us through the wonderful curtain of His God made love. He doesn't see a sin sick old man. He sees the redeemed child of God. And I just want to thank God for that privilege of being a part of that precious family of God. Grumbling or grateful <clears throat> in the chair that you have or that you're sitting in, hopefully you found an index card. Here's what I'm asking everybody in the room to do. I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, but here's what I'm asking, going to ask you to do. If you're in your car or if you're in the multipurpose room, perhaps you've got a sheet of paper or can find something to <clears throat> write on. But I, I'm going to ask that you write down three things that God has blessed you with. Now, before you start writing, certainly we're thankful for the Lord. Certainly we're thankful for our church. We're thankful for salvation. And we're thankful for our family. No question about it. But could it be that you could write on this card... Three things in which you are thankful for that you've not thanked God for in a long time. Perhaps it, one of the things you might write down is one of those things that money just can't buy. That God's blessed you with that money just can't buy. Thursday, I took an index card and I wrote some things down. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. And then I'm going to ask you to do this. Listen, I, I, you know me well enough. I, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a salesman. I'm just a preacher of the gospel. I'm not going to twist your arm to do this. This is certainly not some kind of magical thing. But throughout the Bible, there is such a thing called the altar. And the altar is where the people came and they worshiped the Lord. They offered sacrifices to the Lord. They prayed to the Lord. They thanked God. It's just a place where they met God. This is, this is what we would call the altar. And today there's a box up here. And I, I just want you, if you feel led to, just to come and to put your card of thanksgiving just in the box. And by doing so, you're just saying, God, I'm just coming up here to the altar. I'm putting this in because I just want to tell you I love you. And I just want to tell you, thank you for how you blessed me. For our church family, you, you know that this is our harvest 
Day offering, our, our Thanksgiving offering. We take once a year. And uh, many of you have come prepared to give. Let me tell you and remind you what it is. Three years ago, when we moved into this building, which was the second Sunday of November, three years ago, we owed $1.2 million on the building. Now we owe $642,000. And 90% uh, of this offering goes strictly toward debt reduction. The awesome thing about this offering is not only are we uniting as a family and we're giving sacrificially, but I also want you to know that 10% out of this offering today, we're tithing on. And we're supporting in our Southern Baptist Convention over 3,000 missionaries. It's what we call the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. That money's going to go toward that. And it's also going to go to our Shiloh Baptist Association Mission Fund, which will help send people, maybe including you, on a mission trip next summer, and it will help you to jumpstart that financially. So here's what I want to ask you to do. Church family, if you're prepared to give your Thanksgiving and harvest offering, then I want you to take your card and take your offering and just come down here and put both in this basket. And by both, just saying, God, you bless me. Thank you for doing that. If you're not prepared to give, you're not a member here, you can't give, whatever. I'm asking you to bring this card to Thanksgiving and just lay it in the box. And by doing so, you're just saying thank you. My wife and I are just going to start here in just a moment. Shirley's going to play. We're not going to sing. My wife and I, we're going to come. And then I'm going to go right over here, okay? And I'm just going to sit on those steps. Perhaps there's somebody in the room today that wants to be saved. You know if you were to die today, you'd go to a terrible place called hell. And can I tell you, this service has built all around the fact that the Lord loves us so much. And the climax of that love is that He sent Jesus Christ to die for my sin and for your sin. And I want you to have a relationship with Him. I'm going to sit right over here and perhaps you would just come and say, I, I, I want to be saved today. I want to ask Jesus into my heart. It would be my great privilege to tell you how you can be saved. Perhaps you've been visiting with us and you know that this is the place where God wants you to plant deep roots and, and uh, He wants you to join. I'm going to be sitting right over here. I'd love to talk with you about that. Perhaps you need prayer today and you got some stuff going on. I, I would love, Christy would love to have the opportunity to pray with you. I'll just be sitting right over here. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to ask you to do, if you would, just so there wouldn't be a lot of congestion. There is some room behind the back row. I'm not pressuring you, but I, I, I want us to start on this side, and if we can just come and then go back up and go around. So if you're on this side, you would just go that way and come down that aisle and just come around, and that way we can keep it flowing. Hey, what an awesome time of worship. And we just want to say thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for how you blessed us. We want to be grateful. We don't want to be a grumbler. Lord, take this offering. Bless it. And Lord, these cards that we have things written down on, we're just laying it before you just to say thank you. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whenever you feel led, just start coming, but let's come this way, okay?
wife Sadie, and she came up and uh, we prayed, and then she said, I want to stay with you. So guess what? I didn't have to pray about that. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, listen, if, you, if you're being baptized today, uh, if you will meet Annette and just go uh, to the back and get ready for that, and I'll be back there in just a moment, so anybody being baptized, you can go on back and uh, get ready for that. <clears throat> uh, this afternoon, we are uh, having our Loving God, Loving Others Day. There are seven projects. Many of you have already signed up. If you haven't signed up, it's not too late. For you just come on today. There are seven projects that we can adhere to, typically by social distancing. Everybody's going to meet right here too, right in this room. And then we're just going to go uh, do projects, whatever you're interested in. We're collecting canned goods uh, for the food bank, CAM ministry. We are uh, going to be uh, buying snacks, collecting snacks for the Daryl Worley Cancer Center. Uh, if, if you're not in the choir but you want to sing, you come on. We're going to go to a few places and sing. Uh, we're collecting men's clothing for a couple of places here in town, uh, men's rehab facilities. Um, we're going to be doing a prayer walk or a prayer drive, probably going to be raining, where you're going to be driving around the middle school is the school we've adopted this school year, and uh, just praying and probably going to the courthouse. We'll give you further instructions about that. And just praying uh, for our community. And then... Um, I can't remember what else, but anyway, some uh, some great ways to impact our community. We're going to come back here around 315. We're also putting together teachers' bags, uh, blessing bags for the teachers at the middle school. Uh, and so we want you to be a part of that. We're going to come back here, have some refreshments. I'm going to announce to you what the harvest offering is. We're going to uh, maybe sing a song or two, and we'll be done by 4 o'clock. Just a great way to try to impact our community for Christ. So that's this afternoon. We won't be meeting Wednesday night uh, because it's Thanksgiving week. On December the 13th, three weeks from today, we're going to be having uh, our Christmas presentation. Christmas changes everything. We're only going to have the one morning service. We won't have an 8.30 service but it'll be at 10.15 this time, and it'll be at 2 o'clock. Some of you might want to say, you know what, I can sleep in a little bit, and I'll come at 2 o'clock. Uh, but we're going to be doing the presentation those two times. I've done a lot of Christmas musicals in my 34 years of ministry. I've heard a lot of musicals. And uh, I want to tell you, from the first song to the last song, the Holy Spirit of God, is on this music. I mean strong songs. And so I encourage you to come on December the 13th. The choir has been working since the end of July on this thing. And uh, it, you're going to be blessed, okay? Boy, it's Thanksgiving. Uh, I, I failed to, re to tell you, so if it didn't work out this way, it's totally fine. Gail and her team will separate all that out. But uh, if you're giving your tithe today, uh, if you could just put it in the boxes on your way out, right outside those doors. Uh, if you put it in here, it's okay. She'll, she'll sort all that out. Uh, I'll be doing a one call later this afternoon. If you're not able to come to Loving God, Loving Others, late in the afternoon, I'll do a one call and let you know uh, what God has done. But we're giving today. We're giving our thanks. We're just giving financially in, in proportion to how He's blessed us. Another way that you have given is through the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes that go to children all around the world. Most of you already know Cosmic Majors is, uh, has been a recipient of that when he was a little boy, and uh, he knows the importance of it. So guys, if you will come, I want you to talk about uh, what, how God has used the, uh, the people at, at Riverview and what's been accomplished. Also, I, I have so many notes here, and you would think I, I could read, but uh, I, I failed to mention, if you're in the parking lot or the multi-purpose room, 
If you want to give to the harvest offering or give your tithe today, uh, one of our leadership team members is going to be standing to the north side of the building. When we dismiss, if you want to pull around and just roll your window down and give that, it'll go in this harvest offering, okay? Or perhaps you have a shoebox, but uh, to help you, we'll just do it like that, okay? I'm going to get ready for baptism and tell you about some good things, but let me say this and then I'm going to turn it over to y'all, I promise. Sadie, you got me a nervous wreck. <laughs> hey, Shorty, where's Shorty at? He's in the back. You don't have to walk back up here, but uh, uh, his actual name is Carol. We just call him Shorty. And uh, Carol Curry, uh, he and his late wife, uh, Linda, have been coming here for several years. And Linda joined, and Shorty never did. And Shorty told me about a month ago, he said, uh, I just feel like I need to join. I asked him then if he had been saved, and he said, yes, I have. I've asked Jesus in my heart, and I've been baptized. And I said, well, Shorty, whenever you just feel led of the Lord. So this morning, he just came. He sat down, and he said, I feel led of God. And this is the day. So, Shorty, we're proud to have you an official part of Riverview. And we love you. All right. How's me to the net? Thank you, church. I just wanted to get up here and just say thank you so much for being a huge part of the shoe boxes. Um, my sister's actually here today, Diana Modlin. She introduced me to the, the shoe box ministry. And I just want to publicly thank you for that, for bringing it to church. But it's just a huge blessing, and y'all give, and the children get to be a part of it. And I just want to say thank you so much, church. Thank you, Miss Annette, for everything that you do with the children. And church, look at this. This is a beautiful display of your giving. And I just want to look across the church, and I just want to see everybody's eyes. Because I just want to say a big thank you for your giving. It's been tremendous. And I cannot... Remember all the people, and I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try. There have been so many helping uh, to, to get this project completed. But I have two people in particular I want to thank. One of them was uh, Mr. Shorty's uh, late wife. She made the bottoms, crocheted the bottoms all year long, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the bottoms. I lost a big worker. We lost a big hero. However, she has already been replaced by two other heroes. One of them, has made hundreds of scarves by hand. The other one has made stuffed animals, cute little one-eyed monsters. I mean, cute little things. She has cut her fingers numerous times. So she has blood and sweat in them. And also, she has made sewing kids for, for, uh, for girls aged 10 to 14. Not only that she made them by hand, and she packed them with love, but she, she, she wrapped them so beautiful, and she wrote a love note. I pray that you, little girl, little whatever, I pray that you know God and you get to know Him and to love Him just as much as I do. So I just want to say thank you to the team that has put all this together, that has volunteered to, to be faithful in a small group, to put everything together for your giving. This is sacrificial when you have given any shows. So brought out and asked me, hey, do you have a goal early on? And you know it's been a little different year. The attendance of the church kind of went down a little bit. The money kind of started trickling in, and I said, I think we can do a hundred. And I was a little sad. And then as you started giving, I said, I think we can bump it up to 150. Well, I am proud to present to you, right now we are staring at 216 boxes. <laughs> We want to dedicate these boxes, so would you please, in a symbol of blessing these boxes, just stretch one arm out and let's just pray and bless these boxes. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that you, you are blessing us with every single day. We thank you for giving us so we can give to others. Lord, we are not missing one thing and we love you and we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Right now, specifically, we want to pray for these boxes that you bless them. They may reach maximum impact. And Lord, we want the center of it all. We want the message of the cross to make its way through to pierce that boy and that little girl's hearts. And Lord, we want at least 216 boys and girls to be saved.
for your glory, Lord. We would like for them to be mighty warriors of the faith, the church of tomorrow. Lord, we thank you for everything that you are giving us. In Jesus' name, amen. my friend Adriana. Adriana uh, was saved two or three weeks ago on Wednesday night in the children's ministry. And uh, again, let me just say thank you to everyone who participates and leads in, in children and student ministries on Wednesday night. You'll never know the seeds you're planting and the effect that you have in these young people's lives. So Adriana, you ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart to save you, yes, and you want to live for Him. All right. Well, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And boy, this is a great, great honor. I'm going to ask Daniel to come down. This is Adriana's dad. This is Daniel Walter. And uh, Daniel, excuse me, just as far as you know, that's good. That's good. I want to tell you that Daniel serves in our military. And uh, he is getting ready to go back on uh, active duty. It could be tomorrow. It could be three or four months from now. He told me that when they call, he's got 24 hours to be in route to wherever they send him. Daniel has served overseas. Daniel's seen a lot of things, experienced a lot of things. Daniel started coming to Riverview all four or five weeks ago. Um, last Sunday, I got a call. We were eating lunch. I got a call from Brother Jerry and said, Daniel wants to talk to you. He wants to talk to you now. So I left the restaurant and I went to where they were. And uh, I had the great opportunity to lead Daniel to the Lord. And Daniel trusted Jesus Christ. And uh, Daniel, I'm so proud of you, man. And we met this week and, and uh, this is a big step for Daniel. I, I hope Daniel doesn't mind me telling you, but four or five weeks ago when he started coming, he was an agnostic. Just He's seen so many things, he just wasn't sure. What, what was happening and if God really cared. The Holy Spirit began to deal with his heart, soften his heart, and uh, he and Brother Jerry had talked several times, and I just got in on what the Lord was doing in Daniel's life. And Daniel, this is a great testimony, just like you put on the military uniform. You're just putting on the spiritual uniform today. I'm so proud of you, and uh, it's your testimony. You've asked Jesus into your heart that you want to live for him. It is my great privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, it's been a 
good, good day. I hope some of you can come at 2 o'clock and uh, we'll try to impact our community for Christ. We won't be meeting this Wednesday. I know Thanksgiving might look a little different for a lot of people, but uh, I trust that you'll have a good, good Thanksgiving. And I hope to see you next Sunday. Let's stand together. And uh, Lord, thank you for what you've done today. We bless you. And I pray, Lord, for these folks that you would be gracious to them and bless them. May your face shine upon them. May your countenance be lifted up on them and give them peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. Love y'all.